the live stream started. Let me confirm. I don't think I see it live on YouTube yet. Yeah, now it uh, now it showed up. Um, I'm gonna send the link in there. Oh, oh, I see it! Yay! This is so exciting. I'm so glad we're all here. Oh, thank you. Uh, so let um, as I mentioned before going live stream, let's let us give like uh, two minutes more uh, for people um, to join. In the meantime, I'm gonna share a link to the live stream in um, in Slack. So for those that are already watching somewhere some time, uh, it's a live stream that is supposed to be an onboarding to Async API. <laughs> it's supposed to be. Don't promise too much to yourself. Uh, um, especially that um, from the script, I don't think we're going to talk about Async API too much today um, because um, topic is so wide that um, we will probably end up with three live streams. Oh yeah, let's see. Okay, shared everywhere possible. I think we can start um, at, in the end, like it's recorded, right? So a um, few organi organi organizational <laughs> information. So that um, so this is supposed to be an async API onboarding. Um, the, the reason we're doing this um, onboarding um, it came from the uh, mentees that joined Async API for Google Season of Docs. Um, they um, said um, that they would like to have some kind of onboarding, some explanation about uh, event-driven architectures and Async API. And um, I volunteered to provide it because um, I already had a kind of script ready because I was preparing it for the um, SOAP conference at the beginning of June. So the thing is that it's, um, from my experience with the script, I know that it's not something that we can fit in one hour if it's supposed to be something useful. Um, I estimate three hours, um, uh, but let's see. And there was a really good idea uh, from the community that we should just basically split it into a few parts, one hour long, um, for two reasons, like one, um, I was doing the workshop in person with people and I already saw that after two hours people were super bored uh, because it's hard to be entertained for a longer period of time and also online I think it's even harder to keep people um, on track so we are gonna like this one uh, the part one is happening today and part two I'll schedule for um, next Wednesday I hope that's fine uh, that we don't do it one day after another, um, because the the um, at least my my plan is to have a one week breaks. Uh, first of all, to apply the feedback. Um, if something will not be the best in the in the script, you think I should show it better next uh, during part two or part three, then I'll just uh, digest the uh, the feedback and improve. Um, and also it will be like, you will have one week time to ask follow-up questions. Um, so yeah, I think that's it. Um, today, 
I'm almost like I'm 99% sure that we will not talk about async API, like explain what async API is. It's really, uh, it's going to be really basic explanation of um, event driven architectures. Um, also, um, some different terms that you can uh, see in the world of um, of async API, so protocol, async um, uh, APIs, um, specifications, what all these things are. Um, I'll try to use as, as less technical uh, terms as possible. Um, and then we will talk about the uh, examples of event driven architectures in the in real world where they are uh, applied. And um, last but not least, if we have time, we will do some hands on. Um, play with API um, because there's the only one I found in the world that is publicly available for free without registration. So we will be able to do some, um, yeah, hands-on. But yeah, uh, let me share my screen with the with the um, with the script. Okay, can you confirm that you can see a GitHub? Yep, looks great. Okay, perfect. So first things first, like um, I'm not a fan of, um, of slides if it comes to workshops. And so I just have a markdown files. Um, um, so the script is in the markdown file. I will just uh, use zoom in, zoom out uh, to focus you on a given part of the script. Um, um, so yeah. After the workshop, let me know. Do let me know if you prefer that part two is um, a set of um, of slides. Uh, but I think that if it's not a slide, it's a markdown that I scroll through and and zoom in and zoom out. Maybe it will keep you more focused on the on the on the whole workshop. So um, please let me know later how did it work for you. Um, and the link to the script, uh, I will send. It's in the um, it's in the invite, but anyway, I'll share it on YouTube uh, stream as a link. Um, okay, so let's start. So yeah, um, APIs in theory. That's going to be a first thing um, I'm going to talk about. Um, we will go through some real life examples uh, later. And again, as I said, if um, time uh, allows. <laughs> We're gonna do some hands-on, but yeah, let's see. Um, if it comes to the um, etiquette of the workshop, um, it's the the plan is to not have it like a like a webinar that you just listen. Uh, it's I would say unofficial workshop, so feel free like to jump in. Um, uh, if you prefer to raise your hand using Zoom or uh, just drop a question in the in YouTube, just feel free to do it. I'll just stop. And and try to answer as much as possible because on the other screen I see the chat in the in the YouTube and I also see the list of participants so I will see your hands uh, raised um, um, so I will be able to stop and ask um, ask you to to unmute and ask your question um, and also I will open the uh, Zoom chat just give me a sec so I also see comments in the Zoom. Can we add the link to these markdown um, to the Slack as well? Because it's going to get lost in the stream chat. Yes, I just added it to this um, uh, thread we have about the workshop in the docs channel. I just pasted the link there. Woohoo! Thank you. OK, cool. Um, so yeah, first things first. So APIs, the, the most important thing is to understand what APIs are in general. And I like to always think about it like um, it's um, like it's basically an interface that you can also see in real life when you have a um, interactions between people. So you can say that two people talking to each other are two services that um, have their interfaces. And um, there's a quote. Um, I tried to Google it a bit uh, um, to find if it's just in Poland in the office that I was working in. But um, at the, in the past, when I started in IT as tech writer, and um, we had to learn something from Java developers, some of them were pretty uh, like uh, typical cave um, people. Um, so um, uh, we 
it was really common that we were you know, like to um, to um, uh, explain to some new technical writer like how they should approach a given developer. We are always using this uh, also this phrase like they have a heavy interface. Like so, don't go to Peter. Um, uh, because he has pretty heavy interface, uh, go to other Java developers, they'll help you out. And, um, and then if, uh, if they're not able to help you out with your questions, then, then go to Peter. So, um, so it, it really maps one-to-one, -one, in my opinion, to the, to the world of the, of the services and the APIs. So it's basically the, the interface um, that, you, that you have uh, on the service or on a human that you can use to communicate. And um, you can um, see some, some simplification if we would say that we have a, uh, in, that we have the, like people have API, uh, the, the interface, and they can also document it in a way, the life would be much, uh, much, much easier. Um, so for example, um, for me, it quite often happens that people um, direct me um, saying like, sir or mister. Um, so we could, for example, limit the, the communication between us. If I would have an, my interface would allow you to ask, to check with me, uh, what is my, uh, what is my title? Um, you would not have to have this, um, conversation with me checking, um, how you should, um, uh, talk to me. And, and I think it's, um, also the most important because later on, I have some image with Polish president and and uh, ex us president um like like this bits and pieces like uh, sometimes in the conversation with people uh you you want to know if there are some certain jokes you should not say because it's not going to be a good start for a conversation um so you can imagine that like again like services and humans we all have our um interfaces and it's um, and if we, it would be clearly documented and exposed to the outside world, what information you can get from a from a given person, what kind of conversations you can start, uh, life would be much easier. And that's why, thanks to it, um, the communication between services and building applications is much much easier than um, than it is in conversations with humans. Um, you can later on have a look on solid project. Uh, that's something that uh, Fran pointed me to when I was uh, talking about this um, conversation like human API uh, on Twitter. Uh, so it's pretty, pretty nifty and solid, uh, actually solid project to follow if it comes to human APIs. Now, um, Another term that you're gonna see uh, in the world of um, event-driven architectures and async API, we quite often say, this is async, this is synchronous communication, this is async communication. So th the best way to understand, and let me, this one, let me zoom more if it's possible. So for now, just left, look on the left side. The left-hand side shows you a, a synchronous communication, a synchronous communication over HTTP protocol, um, um, here you can see um, a, a, a pattern called um, HTTP polling, but the, the most important is the, um, the, the communication, the synchronous communication. So you have a donkey and you have Shrek, and they basically travel to some, uh, some um, place. Uh, I think it was a, some kingdom, seven um, mountains and seven forests um, uh, away. Uh, and the and the donkey asks um, constantly Shrek uh, a question if they are there yet if they manage to get to the uh, destination, and it like you can imagine it um, that donkey is basically poking uh, Shrek all the time for the information. So he expects in real time um, uh, re he requests the um, um, the answer and gets a response. Sometimes the, at the beginning response, like in the cartoon, it's pretty okay. But you can imagine at some point of time, if you're bombing a service with too many questions, uh, you can get a connection timeout. There are some rules on the services where you can basically cut a connection uh, if it doesn't follow some rules. So, so that's basically a synchronous, what, what we mean by synchronous, that you have um, two actors and um, in majority of cases, 
you expect when you ask a question, you expect the answer. When you send a request, you um, expect a response that will tell you if the request that you've sent was processed, if it was processed um, uh, successfully or not. Um, and, and that's the what we mean synchronous. Um, in a synchronous world, um, for example, in the in the case of WebSocket protocol, uh, the case on the right hand side would look much different because in um, in a synchronous world, you don't expect to have an answer at the time when you ask the question. Your question is basically saying, "Okay, you let me know are, if we are there yet," and and then you just send me an update, so like where we are. So I, I'm not asking you every time, like, are we closer? Are we getting closer? Are we getting closer? Uh, it's totally opposite. Like you just say, I want to I wanna have an info. And then um, the server or Shrek will notify you every given time or only when there's some change in the system, will let you know like, that we're getting closer or that only 50 kilometers or 40 miles. Um, uh, left to the uh, destination, et cetera, et cetera. So you're basically subscribing to information, um, uh, subscribing to the server. So it sends you an information, what's the status of a travel in this case? So again, to summarize, like synchronous, synchronous it's like ping pong, uh, but a ping pong in like, you expect the pong back um, immediately. And um, the, uh, in asynchronous, you just say what information you want to have. And then the stream of messages will get to you um, regularly or not, but it all depends on the system. But you don't have to overload this, um, the server to get um, the information you want. Now, uh, I already introduced here uh, two terms, HTTP and, uh, and to WebSocket. So that's another thing that you will see and hear in the world of um, async API and, and event-driven architecture. So protocols, uh, what is basically a protocol? And when I started in, um, in tech, um, I still did not know what protocol is. I, I could not understand the explanation of Java developers, um, even though I finished my uh, computer science studies. Um, it was never clear for me until somebody told me about the diplomatic protocol. So um, not sure if you're, uh, if you're aware of diplomatic protocol, it's basically a set of rules that um, people like diplomats should follow when they meet each other, like how they should behave. Uh, so like um, if the guest stands on the right hand side of the of the host or maybe on the left hand side of the host, like at what moment the uh, national anthem uh, will be played and uh, how they should behave, where they should stand, uh, what uh, about the flag, how it's going to be handled, all these things uh, like etiquettes and, 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 and protocol, it's the same in the in the in the communication. So, um, and that's the picture I was referring to. So it's uh, on the right hand side, you can see Polish uh, president couple and, um, and on the left hand side, uh, an American president couple. And again, like the protocol says clearly that you, when you uh, interact between each other, um, a woman should um, first uh, put her hand out uh, to shake a hand of, of somebody like you should like uh, even a president should not be the first one that pulls out the hand and in this um, situation the U.S. president uh, did it in the wrong way he was the first one that pulled out his hand and uh, the, the first lady of uh, Polish uh, like of Poland uh, she did it later but she directed the hand first to um, the first lady of U.S. So you basically like because of not following the protocol, uh, there was a tiny diplomatic issue, and it also reflects how it works in the in real life with protocols. So protocols like they describe the same, like in tech they describe the same, like communication between services, uh, between different things um, in uh, in tech. And um, protocol is a like it's a set of rules, right? And someone wrote these rules, but sometimes implementations don't—they don't implement protocols 
as the, you're described. Um, uh, so there are some mistakes, some misbehaviors on the server side, uh, just like in the real life, just like with the diplomatic protocol. And um, also another example of HTTP protocol, um, I gave you a just, just small uh, snippet from the Async API uh, website. You, what you can see is a screenshot, like when I go to the browser and in the console, I can see what happens when I try to access um, AsyncAPI.com, right? So what HTTP protocol is, it's a set of rules again, like um, what, what happens between servers when they, when they use the protocol, what uh, what uh, the uh, the mm, the entity that sends a request should do, and what the entity that receives the uh, request should do in the response. So um, in case of HTTP, you can see like the browser, because we put HTTP or HTTPS uh, scheme, it knows browser knows that should follow the um, HTTP 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 protocol, and it knows that with first request. It should send a, um, a a request to the server uh, with using method get. So it specifies what's the what's the method, um, what's the scheme used, um, and additional uh, information that is needed for a given request. And then the server on the other side, in case of uh, asyncapi.com, it's Netlify that serves asyncapi.com. Uh, the server gets a request for asyncapi.com and it's a get request and it's to the root. So it knows that it should send back an index HTML file. Um, and it's all described in the HTTP protocol. So how this whole communication should be handled um, and how the um, different entities in the, in the architecture should implement it. Um, specifications. Now, if it comes to HTTP protocol, HTTP, HTTP protocol, um, I, I mean, to simplify, of course, many uh, people that are longer in tech will uh, immediately complain that there are more, but uh, I'm biased and I see just two. It's open API. Uh, that is, uh, in my opinion, the most uh, popular. Uh, even though I wrote here that it's for REST APIs, I know that in 3.1 version, they removed this reference from the spec. So it can be for any HTTP APIs uh, because there are different. Um, but yeah, it's, um, it's a specification is definitely not a protocol. So specification is um, um, a, a way, a, a, um, a, a kind of um, contract that, that tells you how you can describe your application, how it follows, uh, how it implements the, um, uh, the given protocol, how it's using the given protocol for the communication. So um, let's say REST APIs, uh, um, you use open API to describe your, your um, API interface um, uh, that is using HTTP protocol and you specify like what get methods you have on the, on the um, on the server, um, if anything can be created through your server uh, service, um, et cetera, et cetera. So you describe all this, all these things in details, what's possible through HTTP protocol to be, uh, to happen with the, uh, with the, uh, with the server. GraphQL, um, I don't think it's very much useful for the whole um, onboarding and explanation. Um, it's, uh, it's basically a query language. So, but it's, under underneath, uh, it's based on HTTP protocol because to send a GraphQL uh, query to a server and ask for some information from the server, the transport protocol is HTTP. Uh, and async related protocols. Um, this is more important for you to know. Um, and again, I don't write uh, a specific name of the protocol. We're gonna get there later. Uh, that's one of the most complicated things about event-driven architectures here. But yeah, async related protocols. Um, there are actually three I could mention here. So one is async API. So async API is a pro, um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, I say as a specification. So uh, I mean protocols for the uh, specifications for the protocol. So async API uh, specification allows you to describe what your application, what what users can do with your application. 
um, um, like how they can interact with your application um, using your API. And you describe the, the entire application with Async API. Now, cloud events, that's not something um, like in case of open API and GraphQL, you will never use both for, for a single API. In case of uh, event-driven architectures and asynchronous uh, protocols, Async API and cloud events, they complement each other because cloud events, it's a specification, but it's only focused on the, on the, um, on the message itself to put it like in a, in a common envelope, like you have an envelope when you send a letter uh, where you put an address, you have some rules, uh, how the envelope should look like, what's the size, et cetera, where you specify the uh, recipient and, um, and sender. Uh, that's what cloud event is. So it's only focused on a, on a message while remember async API is more than that. It's not just listing what messages you can send to the application, but also where you can send it, what security is, is applied, et cetera, et cetera. So you should basically mix both, uh, not just choose one um, because they are both um, being pushed as standards. Now you will also um, hear a term schema registry it's mostly uh, coming from the world of Kafka brokers. Um, um, and it's, and it's uh, um, in case of a schema registry specification, it's again, it's just a set of rules how you should implement a server that is storing schemas for your messages. So um, let's say, um, let's say the, the conversation that we're, uh, um, the, the explanation about the API that I gave about um, humans having a conversation. And you can say that like there would be one message that we call um, greeting. And this message greeting uh, would have, um, like we would expect that it has um, two attributes. One is the, uh, the greeting message um, and we should specify it as a string. And the other one be um, the um, emotions. Like what do you should, like what emotions should be, uh, what emotions are shown by the user that is starting the conversation. So it's uh, another uh, property in this, in this um, message that we're sending to, the, to another human. And um, these two properties in an object that are sent to another human, uh, they, the best way is if they are described, they have their um, schema defined. So we know what are the names of the properties, what kind of data is sent, if it's string or something else. And, um, and it's needed because like the user of the API needs to know how to name these properties when the message is being sent. And we're calling this schemas of the messages. So we can basically see the dependency. Um, Async API um, describes the entire application. Cloud event uh, describes um, uh, the, uh, a given message. Um, but sometimes you don't want to mix them in one document uh, you want to have these messages, the schemas described externally. You want to share them between different services. You want to share them between different teams. Um, you don't want them to have their own schemas for, uh, for the services if in the end they send the same messages. So you create schema registries. So basically a, a bank of schemas that I can reference to and point to in my Async API document. So um, again, greeting message in my async API document, I could say, okay, the schema of the greeting message is in the schema registry under a given path. Um, so I don't have to copy and paste it into document. So I don't have to um, repeat myself in uh, many different places. So um, that's if it comes to the specifications in the uh, event-driven architectures. Now, event-driven architecture, what is it? Um, I like this question answer, so, um, but it's something that I already said, like the question is, why would you use even driven architecture if you have REST APIs? Like you can do HTTP polling uh, and ask every five seconds if there's some new update in the system. Um, but the thing is, no, like um, uh, to know what's happening in real time, uh, you should not be asking for the update every five seconds. You should get a notification that the update happened in the system. And that's where um, event-driven architectures are needed. Or um, um, example, me as a 
me as a father of three kids. Um, Another pattern that we could put here as event driven architecture, what it is, is like when you want to send a message and definitely you do not expect uh, the answer from a recipient of your message. Uh, it's just a message, um, no conversation. Now, uh, there are definitely much more patterns. Um, and you should um, uh, definitely check it out 60 something. Uh, pretty interesting uh, resource. Now, uh, even driven archi architectures, they're not, not new. It's pretty, pretty old uh, thing that was there already many years ago. In the browser, you can see it um, easily on our website. Like So when you hover over open studio a button and it changes the color, it's because um, uh, someone wrote a CSS on a given element uh, saying that on hover, that is the um, B, um, and that is the uh, behavior that should happen in the UI, that the, uh, the button should change the color. But it's not because the element, there's some mechanism underneath that the element is checking, like, is the mouse on, like, hovering on me already? Like, is the mouse hovering on, on me already? Like, is the mouse hovering on me already? No, like, underneath, there's just like uh, in the browser, like uh, probably hundreds of uh, events triggered every few seconds, uh, if not more. And in case of the Hoover behavior, there's a event called mouse over. Um, so um, um, without event communication, uh, it would be super hard to do the browser things and all this um, fireworks. Now, why it's now so popular? So it's mainly because of microservices. So um, before microservices, so basically um, three different servers communicating to each other. Um, before that, we had all these three services um, uh, in one server, and it was called a, um, a monolith. So it was a huge server with many different functionalities, um, and but they still needed to communicate like the services inside one server. They still needed to work in uh, sometimes in an asynchronous way. Sometimes some situation in a system had to be uh, replic uh, not replicated, but um, um, communicated to different services. And it was done through events as well. Um, at least that's how it worked in my um, the monolith that I was working on in my previous company. Um, that's how many extensions were written in, in Java because of events uh, that were populated in the whole system. But the microservices uh, made it, like put it into the Renaissance, like more people started talking about it because basically microservices, um, after the hype, people notice that they are pretty difficult to handle the communication. If you want to do point to point um, request reply communication, it's getting pretty complex and um, only event driven is the, uh, the solution here. And then um, I think that serverless is putting it to the moon really. Um, there's, a, there's a huge discussion around, that's why actually cloud events, uh, came up uh, this whole um, need for having a a one way of describing the the message like this this envelope on top. Um, it was um, it was basically um, why the whole discussion about cloud even started because it's actually coming from the serverless working group from uh, Kubernetes uh, from CNCF. Now, EDA protocols like. Yeah, I just mentioned a few the ones that are uh, supported by Async API, uh, pretty large number. Um, the most popular, the ones that, again, I'm basically biased because uh, it's just my view, but whenever to Async API, people come and ask how to use Async API. Um, the, the most common is WebSocket, Kafka, and then MQTT, I would say. Um, but I would not, um, like um, say which is the most popular because I hear them uh, constantly. And then the, the rest, of course. Um, so again, protocol, you remember when I said like, it's a set of rules like that describe how um, um, information is transported. 
um, between two different um, entities. Um, and yeah, all of these protocols describe it a bit differently. Now, add a docs. I have, that's my, that's my statement if it comes to um, even driven architectures and describing it. And um, I, I have this statement from my perspective as um, ex tech writer um, that later on moved into development and product ownership. And I remember that in the past when we were doing just um, REST APIs and there was just open API and everybody were using it, it was pretty, pretty simple to, to learn from others. Um, to learn from others because, um, um, again, it depends how you learn, but I always learn uh, from examples. Like I read the docs, of course, but I um, docs without examples for me are um, pretty dry, I would say. Um, and if there are not many examples, it's pretty hard for me to understand some, uh, some subject. Um, and that's why I think basically that that's the thing with the with even even driven architectures and async um, and also async API itself, because um, like just look at at some examples that I have here. So program I always have problems with pronouncing this program web. Uh, it's a, one of the uh, two portals that I know the most that list different APIs. They have. Um, like from cat API to whatever different APIs, it's a basically a catalog of APIs out there in the world that you can um, browse through and, and see um, uh, what APIs are out there and you can interact with. And they have like 24,000 um, different APIs registered and just around 150 is about asynchronous API. And it's not even async API, that's why in the space here, um, uh, so you can imagine like not many examples and looking at the amount of the protocols that we have, like then uh, again, like the examples of a given protocol, it's, it's even less. Then in rapid API, like they don't even provide the final uh, number of all the APIs that they have there registered, but like thousands and everything is um, the, for the synchronous APIs. In APIs Guru, you can find like over 2000 examples of open API uh, files. So again, like when you're starting with open API, it's super easy to, um, to go through this huge database of, uh, of an examples and learn um, because you don't, I mean, reading the spec and following the spec from bottom up, bottom up it's boring. Uh, it's better to just take an example and cut out some pieces out of it and, um, and just do some Frankenstein. Um, then, um, then something from from the ground, and API tracker has seven async API examples, and um, and it's not because uh, uh, I don't know, like somebody's lazy and not not uh, putting them. Um, it's uh, first of all because um, even driven architectures, in the majority of cases, they are internal APIs. Um, and they are responsible for the communication inside the product, not as a as a interface to the outside world. In majority of cases, it's internal. So if it's internal, then why people would share their internal APIs? So the uh, like the largest amount of the examples that I've mentioned here, it's WebSocket, because from the public perspective of public APIs, uh, the most common are uh, WebSocket-based APIs. Um, because that's mainly designed for the UI. So they have to be public um, for the UI. And also sometimes, but very rar rarely, it's MQTT, uh, which is for IoT use cases. Um, so that's what make even driven um, not, um, um, not, the, uh, not the easiest um, to handle. Yes, uh, and Missy made a comment that the examples from RP Tracker are out of date, and yes, they are. They are, um, but yeah, let's change the subject. <laughs> um, so the um, 
and remember, especially if it comes to event-driven architectures, like you don't even have to, um, like it's not just to understand event-driven architectures and understand async API. And like when you have examples of async API, you just use them and case solved. Like uh, I have documentation covered. Like no, it's it's uh, it's even much more complicated. Like async API, like open API, it's just for some so-called reference um, documentation where you describe everything that you can do with the application. But as you know, especially like uh, Google Summer of Docs um, uh, mentees that already started and got familiar with the whole um, uh, information architecture that um, Alejandra recently introduced, like um, uh, reference docs is just part of the entire um, uh, of the entire um, information architecture. There are more information that you have to provide. Uh, more documentation, tutorials, etc. So, uh, just to make it clear, async API is not uh, just the only solution that you should take into consideration. Although, of course, it seems like we should say that it's obviously the best one, <laughs> <laughs> and there's no bias in saying that, right? No, no, no. Bias. no. <laughs> um, and and the last um. Last section from, from this uh, theory, let's say, is the, I call it EDA setup, uh, just to simplify as much as possible. And I want to highlight this, um, uh, this setup, uh, that, this thing that I call setup, um, is because it's also good to understand these two different setups in even driven architectures, because they also cause some headaches in async API to zero. Um, because these two setups are different. Um, you're going to see in a second why. And because they are different and they show different perspectives, um, you can imagine that if you have more than one perspective, with describing it with one spec uh, is, also, um, is getting complex. It's not com getting complex only because of how you put the information in the spec. But it's also um, when you have two contexts, like you have two different ways of doing things. When people come, for example, to Async API, they just know their context. They just know their uh, setup that they are working in and uh, they don't know all the different setups. So for them, it's hard to digest, like why something is done in a spec this way, uh, why it's not more simplified. Um, and it's taking us a lot of time as well to address these questions and explain why things work in Async API this way and not the other. But yeah, go, talking about the setup, the first setup, um, something that I just called uh, here a client and a server. So basically, uh, that's the simplest one. And it's um, very easy to present in case of WebSockets. So again, like WebSocket, mm, uh, is a protocol that allows you to, um, to basically on, on one connection between two entities to have an open, uh, constantly opened connection. And in the same connection between these two servers, um, um, you can send, uh, you can send uh, like exchange uh, messages bi-directionally. So um, over the same uh, internet let's say connection, you can send and receive messages at the same time, and you can send, send multiple um, messages and receive multiple messages. And that's very much useful in the UIs um, when, for example, you, um, you have an application that lists, um, for example, status, travel status updates. And you're interested, like um, you want to know like what's the latest status, like, is, like for example, the plane, did it arrive already? Or not? Like you can imagine this, um, this huge screens that you have in the uh, at the airports, uh, where the all the uh, arrivals are listed. Like um, um, technically, you don't want to have an application that is like asking in the background, like any updates to flight to Frankfurt, any updates to flight to um, to San Francisco. No, so they are connected through, let's say, a web socket to the server that gives you a status updates, and and there's a, um, um, there's a con connection that is maintained over which you get updates and, you know, like Frankfurt arrived, uh, San Francisco is delayed, um, Warsaw is not going to come because there's a, a strike of um, uh, some folks at the airport. Um, and that's 
um, that's where you have this communication between clients and different clients, multiple clients and one server. So it's just one place that exposes the messages and sends the messages about the status. And you have multiple clients connected directly to this single server. Uh, so it can be a browser uh, where I'm checking the on, on the website, I'm checking what's the status. It can be a mobile phone. So I have a mobile application that also um, is subscribed to messages from this WebSocket connection and is checking what's the status changes. Uh, and I can have a, a TV screen as well. Um, and it's important to know that in this setup where you have multiple clients in the server, uh, async API is used to describe the server, this, uh, this flypoland.com, uh, where async API describes, okay, how the server, how to connect to the server, if it's WebSocket or not, how, what's the URL, uh, what are the messages, like how the message, the status message looks like, what information is presented uh, in the object where I can send, uh, see the, uh, the name of the airport. Uh, in the uh, in the status update, in the message where I can see if it's arrival or departure, all of this is described for the server, and it's described for the clients. So the browser, um, the developer that implements the browser, he from the async API document he learns how the server, how to talk to the server, what uh, I can expect from the server. So to summarize. Async API file for this WebSocket server contains information how to how everything uh, how all the messages are are being um, um, like what kind of messages are being delivered. You can also what kind of messages you can send and how you can connect to the server. Now the thing gets more complicated when again people come from different world world. They never did WebSocket. They never had to deal with this client server um, approach. And they are coming from um, the setup um, of like, um, like this fire and forget. So when you have uh, producers, consumers, or a server that can be a producer and a consumer at the same time, and then there's a message broker. So there's additional server somewhere in the middle between all those different services. Uh, responsible for uh, delivering messages. So um, I tried to do, um, I had a bigger diagram, so I split it, it into smaller parts. So it's not so overwhelming as it's going to be in the end. So we can imagine again, like something related to flights. Uh, so there's a UI where I, as a user can go and ask like, okay, give me updates about this and this flight and send it to this and this uh, phone number. And um, from the UI to flight subscriber service, so the service that is handling the, uh, like ac accepting the information about the new subscriber, uh, it's it's synchronous. Like so, it's this old, uh, like the old, the other approach. Like I'm just sending one one request, and um, and my UI just wants to get a reply if the uh, request got accepted. Uh, because in the UI for the user, we want to send, uh, say the, share the information, like everything is fine. Uh, we're going to send you updates uh, whenever they show up. Now, um, but then the flight subscriber service, it is not sending a HTTP post, like um, a synchronous call uh, to um, another service that will, uh, and ask him like, um, hey, um, uh, monitor service, please do monitor uh, flights for this and that user. The subscriber service sends it to a broker. So that's this in the middle. So we have a broker in this case, in this example, it's a MQTT broker. Uh, so it's, again, it's a server like any other that has um, uh, that implements MQTT uh, that uses a, a an application like Mosquito that implements MQTT protocol, and in there you have uh, you have topics like uh, so um, basically you can imagine like a, a service that is consists of like multiple different pipes with different names, and um, so the uh, subscriber service uh, sends a message to a flight queue. Um, then information about new subscriber, that, like there's a new subscriber that we should notify. 
and um, in this subscriber is interested with flights between I don't know, like uh, Warsaw and and San Francisco, although it's not possible at the moment to have such flight. Um, now, what happens is the monitor service, the one that is checking really what's the status of the flight. Um, as I said, like it doesn't not communicate. The monitor service does not communicate. Uh, maybe I'll make it smaller. Yeah, the monitor service does not communicate with subscriber service directly. They uh, the whole communication happens over this um, this message broker. This one um, one piece of um, of uh, like um, uh, one broker that knows what different topics what different queues, what different channels, there are different names for it, are there. And if the message got delivered to flight queue, um, uh, the broker knows that a monitor service, when it started, uh, it asked a um, broker, okay, whenever you're gonna have some messages sent to flight queue, please send them to um, deliver them to me. Um, now, what it does, it's checking the status of, the, uh, of what's happening in the, uh, with the flights, and it just puts a message on flight status um, a queue. So totally different queues and separated from, uh, from flight queue. Uh, it, and it drops a message like, okay, so um, this that, and, it's, and it sends a message, not just about the, um, um, the uh, Warsaw and San Francisco flights. It sends a status of different flights from all the subscribers that got um, that want to know what's happening uh, with the flights, so it's yeah. Um, again, it sends a message. Okay, um, I noticed some uh, differences in um, in uh, some some changes in the flight between Barcelona and 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 Warsaw. So it sends a message back to the broker on a given queue, and then in the end, uh, we have a notifier. A user notifier service that list is listening is subscribed to flight status um, uh, channel. So monitor service send a message to flight status channel on the broker, and then broker knows. Okay, user notifier service wants to have all the messages uh, coming to flight status. So I'm gonna send a message to user notifier service. Um, uh, what the uh, what's the status uh, status of a given um, uh, given flight, and then notifier service knows how to figure out who was it for, um, what's the phone number, and then in the end it's just doing in this case just synchronous call to the external independent SMS service, asking okay send this and this information to this and that number. Uh, so in the end, um, it looks more or less like this, like the, um, there is, so you can see like, uh, it's not just async, it's sometimes synchronous communication, sometimes asynchronous communication. So you can see like um, the first interaction, it's synchronous. Um, then whatever happens in between the services in this microservices setup and the broker, that's pure asynchronous communication, all based on queues. Uh, subscriber service uh, doesn't care, like subscriber service doesn't care if it's monitor service or some different service listening to the messages. Subscriber service goal is just to send a message that there's a new subscriber, that's it. The monitor service doesn't care if uh, SMS will be sent to someone whenever there's something changing in the, in the flight. Monitor service goal is just to send whenever the uh, something changed in the flight that he has registered, um, it, will, um, it will send messages uh, to the broker. Um, and then again, user notifier service doesn't care like if it was monitor service that sent an update or subscriber service that sent an update. It's irrelevant. For user notifier service, the relevant is the, the payload of the message that was sent to flight status. Um, and then it can figure out um, where it should send the final um, call to a service that will send a message. So um, mapping it to um, um, uh, Donkey and Shrek, like 
so here was the donkey like donkey went to the ui and said like okay i want to know when we will i want to get an update to my mobile phone uh, whenever there is uh, any change in the status of the of our travel to the far far away and then um in the end whenever there is some change um donkey will get an um sms message from uh, from shrek uh, that the there is some change in the system Okay, so that's it if it comes to the theory, and I already see it's 55. Now, um, I don't think we should continue with the next script because five minutes just left for questions. Um, so let's, uh, let's maybe, um, let's see if you have any questions. Like, do you have any questions to this theory that was shared with you at the moment? Okay, cool. So my proposal is because like, again, like it's a lot of talking and showing the screen uh, and some for some of you, it's already late. My proposal is let's not continue further. Um, the, the real life examples and uh, hands-on API, uh, let's do it with fresh minds um, in uh, next week. Um, so, because I don't think we're in a rush unless you prefer to have two um, workshops per week, then just let me know. Like we have this uh, uh, conversation in the docs uh, channel. Um, openly share your feedback. Uh, what should be fixed? Um, because like it doesn't make sense to do something if it's not useful. So so please just uh, let me know. Um, and especially the um, the uh, frequency of the of this training. Like if we should increase it. Um, because I can see that if it's uh, if we were just able to talk about a theory, uh, then yeah, <laughs> it can get longer. Although I'm I'm pretty sure that this is the next hour. Uh, these two scripts are it, it's the next hour, and then uh, that's the third hour, and there's not much here. So we should be able to fit into three hours, in theory, of course. I think this is extremely useful. I also think it's exactly what at least the Jizad folks need based on conversations with them and their questions. Um, I find this extremely valuable. Um, I think the content you have definitely fits into three workshops. And I'm open to whatever the community says, whether they want to have one workshop a week or if they want to try to do it faster. Um, it should really be based on what the community wants so that they don't feel blocked. Um, but I just wanted to say that this is perfect and thank you so much. Um, no worries. So um, just let me know today and tomorrow morning uh, because um, then like uh, tomorrow I will be scheduling the next session. So I can either do it for Wednesday or uh, I can do it for Wednesday, Thursday um, next week. So yeah, just, just do let me know what's your preference. And that would be it for now. So thanks a lot for uh, joining. Thank you, Missy, for appreciating the Trump job. Uh, and uh, uh, see you and hear you next week. <laughs>